we benchmark it against kind of the greatest assets in the world. I mean, um, in terms of great. Katangam, Wakanda, Tanki, we're well placed. We know exactly where we are placed vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. Mm. I think both governments recognise that Chevois is a little unique. You get the technical capability to build the mine. You get the financial capability to actually raise capital to build the mine. And I guess what I frame to them is you actually get the organisational motivation to do it. What I say to investors is I don't want you to own Jevois because we're the only institutionally tradable cobalt equity, but we are the only institutional tradable cobalt equity. Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. We spoke earlier today to Bryce Crocker, who's the CEO of Jevois Mining, the ASX listed miner. They recently completed the transaction in Idaho of the ICO cobalt operation. Um, we talked to him about their strategy for moving that forward. Obviously, we've spoken to Bryce a couple of times uh, earlier this year and things are moving apace. We found out from him what that's going to mean for investors. So if you want to look at some of the topics we discussed, look at the description below, click on those timestamps and that'll take you to that part of the video. And if I could ask that you click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, if you want to see more videos like this, please click the notification bell. Let's hear what Bryce had to say. Hi Bryce, how are you, sir? Matthew, good morning. Well, yeah. yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. Been, been a while, but you've done quite a few things since we last spoke. So I think let's kick off with the usual one minute summary for people new to the story and then we'll get into it. The thematic first of all. So we're big believers in electrification, in the importance of lithium ion batteries and on the significance of specifically nickel and cobalt into the cathodes. It's been a difficult two years uh, from a macro or pricing perspective. Uh, but we're fundamentally believers in the outlook moving forwards. Uh, and we do think that the market as it pertains to cobalt has essentially bottomed and you're seeing now a flushing out of the excess inventory that was created during the period of high prices, particularly in 2017-18. So we're big believers in the thematic, but particularly when we do, uh, the thematic is only one part of the investment theme, the other is the assets, the jurisdiction and the team. Uh, the assets, we identified a limited number of assets that we perceived shouldn't sit within companies our size, hence why we've been focused on trying to bring them into companies, Chevois size. Uh, we executed on one of those in 2019, Idaho, uh, which I'll talk about um, during the interview. And uh, in terms of the quality of the, the, the jurisdiction, it doesn't get any better than the United States, um, particularly as it pertains to cobalt. And again, I'll discuss reasons as to why that's so important. And finally, the team, I guess we've done, we've completed two acquisitions. Um, we've kept a limited number of executives from both. And I think if I, I, if I look at the breadth of what fortunately I as CEO have to draw on uh, in terms of the depth that I've got on the board, the level of support and engagement that I have from my board, and also now uh, the, the quality of the senior management team operating around the world, I do think that what we have at Jevois is a little unusual with a company capitalised at our size. Yeah. Okay. You said that the nickel cobalt thematic is important. I think if investors are thinking of getting into mining cobalt, uh, sp specifically, they look back, you're right, the last two years has been really tough, but you, why do you say it's bottomed? How do you know it's bottomed out? Well, you never know it's bottomed. If anyone tells you they know what a commodity market's going to do, they clearly haven't been involved in commodity markets for long right. enough. But on balance, if we take them in turn, I think for nickel, you have seen uh, clearly developments in Indonesia, which were structurally significant. And you've also seen, I think, over the course of 2019, the, the, just the sheer scale of the electric vehicle announcements that are coming out now, but not only announcements by the likes of European and American leading automakers, they're, they're underlaid by substance. It's real. There, there is a genuine transition that's underway. That transition is now irreversible. Uh, when I sit down with OEMs, I think there's a general acknowledgement that there is no real market for ICE combustion engines in 10 years time. Um, it just doesn't, they don't foresee it existing. So the, the, the scale of the electrification rollout across um, developed markets, obviously China was a step ahead, but now the developed markets are pushing very hard to catch up. 
and what that means for particularly nickel and cobalt supply, given lithium iron is going to be the battery of choice for this initial electrification of, of vehicles, both commercial and, um, and on a personal capacity. The battery chemistry is kind of largely locked in. I mean, we can have debates about whether it should be NCM 811 or 632, but, uh, sorry, 532, but the, it's, been, it's locked in for a period of time, um, 10 years, 15 years, and that entails a level of raw material demand, which is kind of quite disproportionate in both nickel and cobalt to what historically existed. Okay, but aren't you talking the language of, you know, you know, big companies, you know, you, you come from a big company, you're in a junior now, um, you've, albeit you've had a good year, you're, you're still a junior company. Talking about EV thematic, which is, you know, two, three years away from impacting on even producers, let alone where you guys are, I think investors are going to be keen on some where you as a junior are going to create value in the next couple of years, you know, whilst the EV thematic is ramping up rather than talking about macro stories. So can we can we talk about, you know, what your plans are rather than the macro, yeah? yeah? So you made a couple of acquisitions, strategic acquisitions. You've got uh, Idaho, was it ICO? I think you're, you're Idaho, was it Cobalt Idaho Operations, Cobalt. right? Um, you fought really hard. You had to fight really hard to get that. Why? What, what, what did, why did you fight so hard? Why didn't you go for something which is, would have been a lot easier to get over the line? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that, but I, just before we close off the macro, I think the macro is relevant because I do see that we have bottomed on cobalt, the sentiment on lithium. And sure, the market ran too hard too early with the benefit of hindsight in 2017. But the macro, what we're doing at Jevoir from an operational perspective is highly relevant. But equally, I'm optimistic that... Uh, the macro is not irrelevant to what we're looking to do and the macro outlook for your investors. I mean, typically we don't talk about commodity market outlook. If you look on our investor presentations, you'll never see a single slide on nickel. You'll never see a single slide on cobalt. And there's a reason for that because of our backgrounds. Uh, and I'd just like to give your readers comfort that the, they're not buying into a falling market. The market is stabilised. And now I'll answer you the question you asked. My apologies for the distraction. <laughs> the, I mean, why we fought so hard for Idaho? Uh, I mean, when I'm sitting with US politicians and talking about why we're there, I say, with respect, the rest of your country as it pertains to cobalt is moose pasture. Uh, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but in North America, once you take out Sudbury, Ragland, Voises Bay, everything else, and then obviously that's North America more generally, once you narrow down on the US specifically, there is no ore body within the US which has scale and grade to become a mine. So when I'm sitting there in front of US regulators talking about the importance of this mine for the United States, there is no other, absent an exploration discovery, there will be no other cobalt mine in the United States, not only when we start operations in 2021, but also I think in 2031. There literally is nothing else out there in the United States which has the potential to bridge their challenges that they have as it pertains to cobalt supply. The, it, there's a slide on our investor presentation where we benchmark it against kind of the greatest assets in the world. I mean, um, in terms of great, Katanga, Mutanda, Tanki. Now, what we don't show on that slide is scale of resource tons. So obviously we're not 50 million ton of resource. We're not a hundred million ton of resource. We're not 150, we're five currently. We wouldn't have completed the acquisition of eCobalt if we didn't think that five would rise. Uh, but equally, I mean, we're completing a bankable feasibility. Um, headline production numbers kind of two two thousand two and a half thousand tons of cobalt so that's not an insignificant amount of cobalt that's more than most of our peers including Jevois, is looking to produce from nico young uh, and at the other east coast laterites which are obviously as it pertains to some of our peers billion dollar projects uh late 2020 21 it sounds like a long way away but in the context of mining as you're aware that's about as near term as you can as you're going to get and again if your readers look at the slide that we have on that on our recent um cell side site visit that we hosted there's a drone over there's a drone photograph of site and why we were so interested it's it's a partway constructed mine we haven't built we haven't sure we've, we've purchased a deposit that underlays that mine but there's 100 us of expenditure that's been spent and incurred so 
And a lot of that risk capital is done. So things like earthworks, civils, wastewater treatment plant, dry stack tailings, the water ponds, you can see it there. I mean, we've got, we're connected to the grid, there's power, there's logistics, it's all been organised, all the access roads. Most decent cobalt deposits in the world, you've got, uh, you've got to spend 30, 40, 50 million dollars and cut through jungle just to build a road to get in. Uh, this is quite different. Okay. Uh, so let, 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 me ask, let me ask you about it because I, you know the, it was sort of difficult for you to get over the line. There was a little bit of pushback when you you know when you were trying to acquire it. I mean, what what were what was that pushback and why were you getting it? We had a, we put forward a cheap offer, so I can say that now the deal's done. So clearly, if you in terms of deal certainty, if you overpay, you have a hundred percent deal certainty. If you try and underpay, there's deal risk. We're very focused on dilution. We're very focused on the value of the company. We own 5% of the equity on an undiluted basis. We don't give away shares. Okay. Um, okay. No, that, 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 that's fair enough. And, 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 and okay, that, that explains it. Now, get me into what, what was going on up here. Because if I look at your other assets, um, you know, in Uganda and also in Australia, they're a little bit further down the line. Was it a conscious decision that you needed something which was a little bit more imminent in terms of getting to production was that were you being told that by investors or was that always the plan i think it's a case of being told that by investors but i've worked in capital markets a long time and i can tell you that even if we're awarded kabanga or kalembi with regard to our negotiations in east africa either of those are three years from first production i can now Many of my peers will try and tell you otherwise, but from a capital markets perspective, my view is that if you're three years from production, you may as well be 13 in terms of the value that investors are going to attribute to that. Yeah, um, I agree. This asset's different. We're one year from production once we finalise project finance mid 2020. So it's a near, it is near term production. At the level of risk associated with, this, with that production because of the sum capital and because of the flow sheet that I mentioned is different. Mm. And importantly, it's in the United States. Uh, like cobalt is at the, the thematic for cobalt is fantastic. We're about creating an operating company, and to have a foundation cornerstone asset in the United States that that, that has no other cobalt mines. I just think that that's unique. No, and no. I'm having debates uh, with the, with sell side analysts around how that asset is going to be valued, mm. but I just think it's the uniqueness of that asset is ultimately going to be. Uh, reflected in market valuations once we're producing cash flow. I totally agree with you. There's a lot of conversation going on at the moment, certainly in the in the gold space, uh, with what's going on in West Africa, where jurisdiction has suddenly it's been given some sort of meaning with a lot of these sort of uh, incursions by terrorist groups disrupting gold production. But not relevant to you, but the the jurisdiction component becomes more and more imp uh, important these days. Look, um, can we? It's quite clear from the presentation that you guys are focusing your time and efforts on ICO. Okay, you've got a certain amount of money today. What what, what are you sitting on, cash wise? Uh, the last re publicly reported number we had was seventeen Aussie, which was around mid October. Right. Okay. So, how as a percentage, how much of that is going to be on ICO, and and how much are on the other two, well, four projects that you can it like? The Congo I mean, ICO, is, ICO is obviously the key focus. Right. Where we've got a full team mobilised. We're busy at, at site. Or we were busy at site up until November, hmm. undertaking uh, site preparation, significant amounts of drilling to support the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the study team is currently in Toronto, running through their last project meeting uh, for 2019. So clearly the bulk of the focus is ICO. But East Africa hasn't been forgotten now. Again, we kind of downplayed East Africa during the acquisition simply because obviously a significant proportion of the shareholders of the target weren't owning the target because they wanted East African cobalt exposure necessarily. They wanted the United States cobalt exposure. But it's not irrelevant to what we want to do. We obviously acquired M2 Cobalt early in 2019 to complement our efforts and discussions with His Excellency Museveni and the Cabinet with regard to the old Kalembi mine and KCCL refinery. And we're exploring in Uganda. Um, ultimately, it's highly prospective from a geological perspective. Uh, but one of the benefits now is I can go on record and I'll say that Jebois will do nothing in the DRC. 
Now, clearly, we still know what's going on in the DRC. We still have resources there to understand because three quarters of the, you can't be in a commodity where three quarters of supply comes from a jurisdiction and you don't go there and you don't get on the ground, you don't see what's happening. But the DRC is, uh, I mean, the way I framed it in Washington when I meet with the politicians is, and they're, cons and, uh, they're looking at future suppliers, the DRC is un an unreliable partner. Clearly they're, I mean, the way that the Chinese have mobilized there is significantly concerning to not just the United States, but to all of us in the West. Uh, irrespective of the artisanal issue, which is significant from an ethical consideration, you have the overarching political dynamic of the DRC, which obviously gets few people, comf gets few people comfortable. Um, so uh, we're certainly not going to do anything in the DRC, but the geology is just phenomenal, hence why we're across the border in Uganda. Okay, but let's, let's come back to the ICO, because I, I think investors are going to be delighted that you're saying the focus is there, because it's the, it's the nearest, nearest term catalyst in terms of creating real meaningful value, and you're moving just slightly further up the exploration curve, you know, towards development as a result. So, um, what is actually happening at the moment there? How are you deploying your cash? What is being spent? So we've got the bankable feasibility study underway with DRA and M3. Um, so DRA, leading international engineering firm that mm -hmm. uh, Russell Bradford, our project directors, work with for uh, 20 years. Uh, principally across Africa, building mines and mills, much bigger than the one we are, but uh, DRA have establishing their presence in North America. Uh, M3 have been there for a long time. They're based out of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, they do a lot of work with the US government on the space program. This is a small project for them, but again, they've got the CV of 50 to 60 projects that have executed in the US because we're not about, build, we're not about preparing a study. Uh, again, a lot of my peers, they're focused on preparing the 43101 that they put on CEDAR and hope that the capital kind of flutters down from the sky. That's not how life works. I mean, we're preparing a bankable feasibility study. I mean, the cost of this feasibility study is probably four to five times what uh, our predecessor who owned the project was envisaging because it's a different level of rigour. Um, significant amounts of drilling underway. Uh, we completed, I mean, this asset's been around for 20 years. Between July when we closed the acquisition and between November when we had to pull the drills off the hill, we increased the total amount of drilling on the deposit by 20% in just those few months. You can't drill a deposit too much and de-risk it too much ahead of sitting down with financiers and talking about uh, how, how it's going to be structured and how, how a debt facility is going to be structured and what are the terms going to be. So that drilling program was extensive. Um, we kind of allowed the team initially one step out exploration hole, mm. uh, which turned into two after they intersected mineralization. Right. So they were, we reported those early in the year, because again, for us, this, the, the initial mine production is kind of that 2000 tons uh, of cobalt, slightly more. I mean, we do think the mine can be doubled. Uh, Australian Super, who cornerstone, co-cornerstone the equity raise mid-year with, with management and the board, they put in seven and a half, we put in three. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have come on if they didn't envisage the mine potentially being larger. But in order to be larger, you need a greater mineralized envelope, you need scale. So um, it's early days. We only, as we said, we only put down two holes, both of them intersect mineralization. So the geos are always excited, but uh, they are enthusiastic. So we've got a significant drill program planned for next summer uh, as we get underground with opening up the added and the portal associated with underground development to really um, look to increase the size of the resource and to understand what we have. Right, okay, so you're bringing some real robustness to this and you, you know, having been at Glencore, you operate a different way or a different mentality from juniors, right? But you had access to cash then, but you're still employing some of that process, that mentality here. So you've got a, D, uh, sorry, a BFS, which you're, sorry, did you say DFS? Because people, people talk about BFS, bankable and definitive, not necessarily the same thing. For the bankable feasibility study, under 43101, there is okay. a DFS. Okay. We report under both things. So the bankable feasibility is, will be complete in March uh, next year. Right. Um, the, debt, uh, the debt process is already underway. Um, so the information memorandums, we've selected a group of half a dozen lenders, the information mm. memorandums now um, to them. And so that 
uh, that process is obviously, I guess we're not, we're not, as I said, we're not about uh, preparing a study. We're about the steps we okay. have to go through now to start constructing a mine in mid-2020. No, I, I, I entirely get that. You, you were very clear about the, the, this different, slightly different mentality to juniors that we talk to. I get that. Um, you're going to need to raise some money, though, aren't you? Not necessarily. I mean, there will be, in terms of the structure that we're looking at, uh, obviously the, the, the project, unlike other cobalt deposits out there, it's, it's uh, tie grade. I mean, it stacks up on today's prices. Again, a lot of all of our, uh, almost exclusively any other cobalt deposit out there that's not inside the DRC will not work at today's cobalt price. Okay. Uh, this one does. Okay, so not, what does not necessarily actually mean? Does not necessarily mean you've had quite interesting debt conversations and you, you think you can get 100% finance with debt? The conversations are going well. We're looking at various initiatives. It's going to support a high amount of senior debt. Okay. And then we're looking at a subordinated tranche. Um, we're talking to government. And obviously there's customers and offtake arrangements there uh, whom we're also um, speaking to. In addition, you have... You have your convention or your, the type of um, providers of subordinated structures within a senior debt facility, such as your streaming companies, royalty companies. Um, I mean, that's quasi equity, but it's obviously not ordinary equity. Yeah. And so we're looking at a number of initiatives. So uh, my, my message to institutions is you shouldn't be sitting there assuming that you're going to get an opportunity to come in on the register via a placement in 2020. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. I think that... That's quite exciting, potentially. Um, who else are you talking to in, to allow the debt guys to get comfortable? What are the other conversations? Are you talking to end users as well? I think if you talk in terms of project financing, the reality is I can pretend otherwise when, I, as you say, that I'm from Extrata Glencore, but the reality is I work for a $100 million company that has no balance sheet. I can't provide a completion guarantee for a project financing. Um, that's the reality. So in terms of how we're looking at approaching the financing, we have to look, look at who can absorb risk that we can't. So the appointment of DRA M3 on the leads, there's a number of reasons for that. First, we need technical sign-off for completion support under a project finance facility. Now, I have a lot of, if you look, I have huge confidence in our team in their ability to sign off and give me and the board comfort that the technical process is valid. But equally, the banks need someone who's got a balance sheet uh, more expansive than my management team, that level of comfort. Mm. And DRA will provide completion and technical sign-off in terms of production throughputs and performance, technical performance of the plant. As we move forwards into construction, the reason I wanted a group like M3 involved alongside DRA so the feedback I get from my project teams, the concept of EPC or fixed price lump sum term key, I mean, their feedback is it's a waste of money because the project is so de-risked, it's so easy, it's simple, it's cookie cutter, that they can do it without the, the genuine risk of capital cost overruns. Now, I appreciate that, that's their position, but equally, I'm not the person who's gonna be lending the, the project, the banks are. So banks, commercial banks will typically re require capital cost overrun facilities. Those capital cost overrun facilities are often funded by equity, as you mentioned. So we've got, a, in terms of the groups that we've got involved on the debt side, we've got the commercial banks, because this is an eminently project financeable project. It's in the US, it's de-risked, it's in a commodity that everyone likes from a commercial banking perspective. They want to get exposure to COBOL, but none of them want to go to the DRC. So it ticks a lot of boxes. But equally, we, have, we are asking a limited number of alternates what they think of the capital structure to provide us as the board flexibility in terms of how we look at that um, on the EPC side. So sure, the, the risk if the risk of the capital of a capital cost overrun is genuinely low, then we as a board are going to be extremely reluctant to issue equity that we perceive isn't being, isn't isn't commercially necessary. Um, that's where the EPC potentially paying for an EPC premium. It may cost me less overall than the concept of a capital cost overrun facility and issuing equity that as a board we perceive we don't need. Uh, offtake is critical. Clearly the offtaker who we sell the product to is not going to be a $100 million junior market cap company because the offtaker has to absorb risk as part of a conventional project financing structure. 
So the way we're going about it is really focused on who can absorb risk, how do we come up with a structure that makes sense, and what's optimal from a capital perspective. Uh, I mean, I've, I say to investors, institutions, look, we own 5% of the company. We're not going to bet the company. But equally, we own 5%. We're highly sensitive to dilution. If, you, if commercial banks want us to dilute unnecessarily, to de-risk unnecessarily, then we'll look at alternatives to avoid that, clearly. Okay. I think that answers the question. Um, BFS, due March. What are the other milestones for next year which will lend the market more and more confidence that you are going to deliver in 2021? So, we're, again, we're about building the project and how you build the project is you de-risk. So we've got CSA auditing the resource now. So I mentioned the drilling that we've done. Uh, we did as much drilling as we could up until when the snow came. We had to take the rigs off the hill. Um, so, yeah, so we've, we've uh, rebuilt the resource model um, based on that. CSA are auditing it now. Once that's done, we'll obviously publish that and announce the, uh, those results. So I think that that's an important milestone because that just demonstrates that the ore body is what we think. It, it's, holding, um, it, it's just that obviously in terms of resource risks in the mining business, the resource is kind of fundamental to everything. Mm. Um, metallurgical results, because again, we're going back and we're changing the flow sheet. We're going to produce separated concentrates for commercial reasons. There's lock cycle tests that SGS are running in Canada to support the validity that will allow technical completion sign off from the advisors under the project finance facility I mentioned earlier. Releasing those results in January, February, I think will again provide confidence that the resource is there, that the metallurgical and the, the commercial solution is there. Uh, so I think there's a number of quite important steps coming up to the end of the pub the feasibility being published in March, uh, so that that feasibility isn't just necessarily an unveiling of the curtains. And uh, there's a number of steps through there that will provide investors some interim evidence as to where the project resides. And we're in the business of being transparent as well. So and as we get as we get information as it comes through, then we'll feed it and update the market on that. Okay. But, but what what else is happening during that year? Okay, you're going to get the BFS, and I get there's some interim stage stuff, but what are the big moments next year where you're going to turn to the market and say, I, t I, I told you I was going to do this, I've done it. I told you you were going to do this, I've done it. Because there's not too many steps after the DFS, um, or sorry, the BFS, that you, you need to deliver. You've been very clear and articulated quite clearly you know, how you're going to get there, but what is going to lend the market confidence that you're going to continue to deliver those steps? I mean, I'm often asked why we're trading where we are. Mm. And I think that there, this asset has 20 years of history of mismanagement and disappointment. And so after the acquisition, we saw enormous flowback out of North America, where I think investors just looked at the, the uptick in liquidity and just said, thank God I can finally get out of this right. equity which I have. I will do for a long time. As we start to de-risk, so I'm, my institutions ask why you're still trading at 20 cents. I think that until the North American market sees evidence that actually what the asset that they thought that they that existed back in 2010 and 2011 when some of that mine construction originally happened and our predecessor raised almost $100 million to start building the mine, once they start to see evidence that actually there's nothing broken, leadership and management of the previous entity was broken. There's nothing broken fundamentally with the resource. There's nothing broken with the development plan. As we start to build evidence of that and gain and get runs on the board, and also the reality is, I mean, my team and my board, they're well known in Australia, but they're an unknown quantity in North America. When I was in North America, I sat within the Extrata framework and obviously most of our investor relations commitments and activity were either at the very big end of town in New York or across in London, etc. Right. So as we start to build uh, um, knowledge, gaining sell-side coverage for me was important. Um, Jeff Wine never pays for sell-side coverage, so, so there's been no research. I've been very clear. Any institution of note, as soon as a piece of research is paid for, they turn from one side of their desk and deposit it in the bin on the other side without it reading it. Uh, so we hosted five investment banks to site in October. Uh, I purposely didn't go. 
my board purposely didn't go. Uh, we stepped back. There was no corporate chaperoning. And we said, look, part of what we're trying to, part of what we are creating is we're getting a team that you guys, for the type of other companies you cover, you don't get exposure to. So you go, you sit down with our project team, you spend as much, you spend days with them and you pepper them and you gain confidence that the quality of the team that's there is robust, which is, is very fortunate for me. I mean, a lot, of com- a lot of CEOs in my position wouldn't not be able to go on the inauguration kind of analyst sell side, analyst side visit. Mm. Uh, but I purposely wanted to step back and let the team step up. Mm. So sell side coverage, I think, is important. Um, three of the two of the banks were Australian. Three were North American. Uh, there's a couple of other North Americans kind of circling that um, uh, are looking at us. And I think getting that, and again, I'm, if I look at the trading across the exchanges and how we're managing the capital markets um, challenges, because again, obviously we've probably had 100 million shares flow back from North America. So that's there's a reason why we're trading where we are. Uh, but again, I think if you look at the the sell side coverage, the bulk of the sell side coverage is going to come from North America. It's a North American asset. You had a, there was a number of banks that were covering it previously. So I think it is important. And I do see going forwards, I mean, if you go through New York and Boston and Chicago and LA, San Fran, I mean, drive around San Fran, they get the electrification thing. <laughs> uh, there's Teslas everywhere. So the, there's a pool of capital in that market that I don't want to not lose by only having an Australian listing, but I think having a presence in North America and there's a there's a natural there's a natural following there that when the thematic comes back uh, is going to follow Jevois. Okay, so the the question I was asking was I think as you picked up quite quickly to do with share price. Okay, um, you've come from a big big company background, Glencore. You I think we first spoke about just about nine months ago. I think when we first spoke, right? And um, you very much had an institutional, large institutional mentality then. What are you learning during this process you've been through about the junior space, about what, how you talk to the capital markets, how you talk to um, banks and how you get deals done? Do you think it's the same or have you actually picked something up along the way too? I mean, I think it's arrogant to say you're not learning particularly given it's something I hadn't done before. Junior markets is different. Uh, I mean, I'm freak, not frequently told, told less often than I was, but um, by some some in the market that I don't work alongside private equity anymore, you actually have to do kind of tell people what you're up to, mm. hence this kind of interaction with yourself. Uh, I mean, the, the, the naive assumption I had when I came into Jevoir in late 2017 is I looked at the share register and said, I've got to get. I've got to institutionalise this. This is just not right. And I thought if I institutionalise the share register, then liquidity that would that would kind of create momentum, and then everything else would follow. And I could not neglect the retail side, but focus less on the retail side because obviously it's an area with with which I'm less familiar. I mean, clearly, particularly at our end of the market, the institutions are not. Liquidity has fallen off across the board. If you look at ADVs, and it's not a Jevois specific issue, ADVs compared to what they were five to ten years, five, seven, eight years ago, are a fraction of what they were. And liquidity is kind of everything. Um, it matters. It really, really does matter. And I think the retail at our end is an important part of that. Um, so I've spent more time focused on the retail side. I spend, I mean, obviously, calls such as this to provide investors the opportunity to to hear what i typically would only say in behind closed doors at institutional meetings Mm -hmm. and uh, we are focused on i mean if you look at our register there's clearly a high proportion of high net worth but also retail there Um, and i think with the e-cobalt transaction i mean we've got ten thousand shareholders now i picked up Mm -hmm. like uh, 7,000 new north american shareholders which is great i mean we're listed on the otc in the united states uh, it's liquid, it trades, and okay. also I want as you as you travel around the United States. I mean, we've got a lot of we've got a local everyone who I meet locally. I mean, I'm a cyclist. I went to the local bike shop, and the guy that I hired the bike from, he's a Jevoy shareholder. Um, they're all around town in Salmon, Idaho. Like everyone owns shares, which is great because we want obviously 
as we do well. We want that to flow through to the communities and um, where we operate. Okay, so th so that's one that's one learning. What else have you picked up along the way? I mean, I think that you need face time. You need to actually dedicate the. You need to do the, this type of exercise. I mean, it's important to do. Right. Uh, I think that. I mean, I still believe liquidity is is one of the most important measures out there. Uh, so those hundred million shares that flew, that that did flow back, uh, they created a significant downward structural downward pressure on our share price. Mm. But you know what? They created liquidity, and so they got, that gave me access to have institutional meetings in New York and London that I wouldn't have otherwise had. Liquidity creates liquidity. You just have to get liquidity moving for you, not against you. But uh, I think that uh, any liquidity at our end of the market is is positive, and I think that as we deal with uh, as we deal with the the, uh, the capital structure moving forwards, I guess there's new markets that I hadn't paid attention to. So Simon Clark, for example, uh, went through Europe and he went uh, recently uh, on a road show and was seeing. Swiss investors, Austrian investors, French investors, Italian investors. And, you know, there's, again, there's these pools of capital out there, family offices, that is not insignificant. Uh, and it does want to get exposure to the space. And I do think that if you look at, I mean, what I say to investors is I don't want you to own Jevoir because we're the only institutionally um, tradable cobalt equity, but we are the only institutional tradable cobalt equity. Everything else has big capex, which is never going to be built in today's markets. It's a pipe dream. Uh, or every other cobalt exposure is tied up in large public companies, which it may be a fraction of what they produce. They might be DRC focused. They might be Chinese controlled. They might be Cuban related. Uh, there's nothing, if I, if I when we look at the chart of our peers, the problem is we have no peers almost. Once we're in production in Idaho, there are no clean, simple um, investment vehicles to invest in cobalt, okay. which I think the, 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 is, uh, it's, it's, imp it's important. So, so that, that's what you're telling them. And obviously, you know, the whole cobalt 27 uh, situation with Parler, you know, made things very, very public. Um, so people got a bit nervous. So. You told me what you're telling investors. What are they telling you? What, what are they expecting from you? What are they nervous about? I mean, I think invest, clearly anything that's negative that happens in the cobalt industry is not positive for Jevois, as simplistically. Um, so I, although I think that we have advantages over some of our peers, I don't wish ill on our peers. I don't want anyone to fail. That's bad. That's bad for us. Uh, I think that when the investors now are being more selective, they're being more selective about the type of assets they invest in and they're being more selective about the type of management teams that they're prepared to support. And I think, as I said, I look at the, I mean, I don't think I've spent a lot of time in Idaho, but I mean, I'm told that I've kind of spent more time in five months than, uh, than collectively senior management spent over the last five years there. Um, out my, I look at the level of support I get from my board who are, I mean, we, we're very clear about executive and non-executive, mm. but equally we're engaged. I mean, the, the board's engaged, clearly. I mean, they're economically engaged. They, we chose to put in three mil of the 16 and a half we rose, raised in July. Mm. Uh, but it's not a, no one's retired, yeah? Yeah. Um, we're not meeting four times a year and talking about governance and how much the directors are going to get paid in the subsequent year. Yeah. It's a very, very different approach, um, very different level of technical and organisational support that's being applied to build a project. No, okay, I, I get that. The question, the question I'm asking is, when you're listening to your new shareholders and your current shareholders, what are they telling you to do? And do you think you're doing it? I mean, I think we're de-risking the project, which is what they want. Uh, they want evidence of progress in Africa, which we're trying hard for. But obviously, when you're dealing with two sovereign governments, the timetable is not always mm. in our hands. Mm. And they want evidence also that 
the we're adding value to the assets we've acquired and obviously we're working towards that in both uganda and in idaho okay okay fair, fair, fair enough um, and i think you sort of answered a question i was going to ask there which was you know you've learned a few things um in terms of what it takes to work as a, in the junior mining space what do you think you've brought to it and i, I suspect getting a little bit more hands-on seems to be what i'm hearing uh i mean i think that. I mean, you'd have to ask our advisors who do work with us, but I think advisors kind of like to work with us. They don't like how aggressively we try and compensate them. Um, but <laughs> I think that we're bringing, we're bringing your rigor. I mean, if you look across the TSXV and ASX, I mean, I think we're bringing your rigor and a sense of discipline that investors need. I mean, I, I talk to, when I sit down with institutions, I mean, I try not to say it perhaps as publicly as this, but you know what, I hate junior mining companies. They're, 90% of them are completely uninvestable. They're lifestyle companies. They executives sit at the front of aircraft. They go into their office and they've got nice offices overlooking the ocean. Um, and they're doing everything they possibly can not to roll up their sleeves and actually build an operating company. That's not us. It's, 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 it's hard not to, uh, it's hard to disagree with that statement in many, many cases, I think. 60 to 70 percent would be the number I usually throw out there, but um, I, I, I hear you. Look, um, let's t let's talk very quickly, if we can, um, about Kalembe um, and Nico Young. Just just give us the highlights there. What's going on? It's it, it's clearly not priority. It's not focus of cash um, or well, maybe a little bit of time. But they have value, but. You, and you haven't necessarily parked them, but you you are working at a different timeline compared to uh, ICO. Yeah, I mean, let me. I think for Kalembi and Kabanga, the assets were in negotiations with the government. Let me put those at the end. Yeah, um, you, we're active in Uganda. I mean, the board approved US 1.5 mil in the fourth quarter, which we're finalising now. Um, so we're active. We're drilling. Uh, what we're seeing, it's early days, but. That we're optimistic that we've that it's we're in the right place. Okay. Uh, Nico Young is obviously paused, uh, but Nico Young, I mean Michael Rodriguez, our executive general manager, technical services. He's currently in Korea. He's spending most of his time in Japan, Korea. We're actively the level of intensity on discussions in terms of offtake, both for Nico Young and for the other asset that we're talking around offtake on mm. Idaho. It's picked up immeasurably. Um, so although we're not spending any money on Nico Young, simply because we think it's time for someone else to kind of pick up the, um, to, to start uh, picking up the mantle on that for a period of time through definitive feasibility or bankable feasibility, uh, it hasn't gone away. Uh, and so these, the way that I frame it on Nico Young, when I'm sitting down with uh, South Koreans uh, and all the big names, there's a slide in our investor presentation where we benchmark Nico Young against, again, our peers. And I guess my pitch is a little different because I say to them, look, all of these projects, including Nico Young, are not good projects. They're all terrible because I grew up with $8 Cobalt and, I grew, and those of us in the industry, all of these projects on the slide, they're all low margin projects that you need. And I, it's, I think it's a really difficult pitch. If you're a single project company, and you're going in and seeing an institution and saying, I've got a great investment opportunity when commodity prices go up by 200%. That's usually when the meeting would end. So but what I say to the battery makers is what you're buying on Nico Young, it's an option. If Cobalt stays at $16, you never exercise your option and life, life goes on. Uh, the price of the option to get that, for us, we need 15 million Australian dollars to finalize a definitive feasibility study. If I was out in the market trying to raise a billion dollars for this sort of option now you'd be wasting your time it doesn't exist there is no market for 15 million dollars you get an option if cobalt stays at today's prices then fine you don't need it but if cobalt goes to 50 dollars, all of a sudden these projects that i thought in my, because i've grew up with eight dollar cobalt that i thought were poor quality projects you know what they're not poor quality projects they look good um, and if cobalt goes to 50 dollars, my message to the korean battery manufacturers is there's a reason for that. Something's happened. The DRC shut down. Electrification has gone like that instead of that. Um, battery, the ability to substitute out battery chemistries with 811 from higher cobalt chemistries hasn't worked as well. 
something's fundamentally gone wrong in physical markets that leads to this price, in which case you can't get cobalt for your business. And that's when this option that you've paid a relatively nominal value for, that's where it has value, real value. Um, so we're getting traction on, we're getting traction. I mean, I think that Nico Young, it's not a, it's a forgotten market from the equities story. I think everyone's forgotten we're a nickel company, but it certainly hasn't been forgotten by our team in terms of the interactions we're having. And, and obviously we're sitting down with all the, it's not, there's not many companies at our end of the market who are sitting down with multiple commercial items to discuss with battery makers and also have the background. I mean, that Michael and the team do to sit down and also talk to the um, to the Koreans and the Japanese about what we're seeing in physical nickel markets, physical cobalt markets, and how we see um, pressure from OEMs and what's likely to happen over time. So, okay, uh, I'm optimistic on Nico Young. Okay, so that, that that's not dead and buried. Conversations are happening. You'll give guidance on that in the new year at some point as to how things are are going. But you fully intend to monetize that or. Well, not, no, not monetized. I mean, we're looking for we're looking for someone to come on to fund the, the, the definitive feasibility study. So okay, the, so the you... bankable feasibility will be fifty. We need to do drilling okay. prior to commencing bankable feasibility to gain enough measured resource in order to commence the study, and then we undertake the study. So you'll stay. Effectively, that apologies, you'll stay 50. involved. You're just looking for a strategic partner to come and fund the DFS. Okay, got it. Yeah, in exchange for partial offtake. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and same again in uh, in Uganda. Oh, in Uganda, well, there's no obviously offtake discussions in Uganda. It's we're drilling early days, prospective. We're excited, but uh, we'll see. The uh, and then the negotiations with governments on Kalembi and Kabanga. I mean, I've stopped guiding investors on a specific timing because obviously my ability to hold government to account on the timing that they give us. Mm. I think every time I've gone to Uganda over 2019, the, the timing's kind of slipped a quarter each time. So, but they are, I think the challenge is both of these are national assets. So Kabanga is obviously perceived as a national asset in Uganda, uh, sorry, in Tanzania. And Kalembi is perceived as a, it's, Kalembi is a smaller asset, but in the context of Uganda, when it operated by Falcon Bridge, it was 10% of the GDP, and remembered as such. So when you're dealing with governments and what they perceive to be national or strategically important assets, clearly that's a different level of discussion and focus. Uh, we're well placed. We know exactly where we are placed vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. Mm. I think both governments recognise that Jevois is a little unique. You get the technical capability to build the mine. You get the financial capability to actually raise capital to build the mine. And I guess what I frame to them is you actually get the organisational motivation to do it. Mm. Uh, when I sat in one of the Tanzanian's minister's office uh, a year ago, he, had, he actually, by coincidence, he had the pile of Kabanga feasibility studies piled up to the ceiling on his desk. And uh, I said to him, look, if you give this to a company similar to the market capitalisation that wrote those studies, you'll get another big pile of studies on your desk. They're not, they're, they won't build it. Like we will get in there. We will, we, we will find, a lot of companies will find reasons not to do things. Um, we don't sit there and look and try and find a way not to do stuff. We find ways to do it. Um, we will, if we gain tenure of either Kalembi or Kabanga, we will build those projects. And I think governments, they look at the, idiot, the, the kind of um, philosophy that we have as an organisation. They meet with my board. And they realise that, you know what, these guys, I think, we've conveyed that they're serious. We, if, if we get tenure, we will build the project. Brilliant. Bryce, thanks for that. I'm hearing loud and clear, you know what you're focused on, you know what your money needs to be spent on, and your time and attention, which is the Idaho project. Um, keep telling this story. I think it's a good one. It's a good model. I appreciate the update. Uh, stay in touch with us in the new year and let us know how you get on with that BFS. Will do, Matthew. Well, thanks very much for your time.